I am really excited to go through this book together as a church. It's one of my favorite books in the entire Bible, so hopefully you are as excited as I am to open up Colossians. But before we get into the sermon this morning, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about last weekend. Uh, if you were not with us last weekend, we got to hear from Dr. Christopher Yuan, uh, a special guest pre preacher, and his parents. Uh, and it was a fantastic weekend of hearing a story of incredible redemption uh, and powerful impact that God has had on his life, uh, bringing him out of sexual brokenness. And we know that for many of you, that was an incre incredibly encouraging and inspiring message. If you haven't heard it, uh, I encourage you to go back and listen to both Saturday and Sunday night's messages. You can listen to them on our YouTube app uh, or online. And uh, we know that for some of you, that was a difficult message to hear, that it was painful for a variety of reasons. And we just want you to know as a church that that's okay. We understand and that we want to continue to be a place that can have hard questions about important things because of our shared faith in Christ Jesus, who is the one who, as Colossians tells us, is above all things. So if, to that end, would you pray with me that as we continue to be a church for where you are, that God would be with us and help us to be that church because we cannot be that without his spirit. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you for your great love for us, your love that knows no bounds, that is unlike any other love that any of us can ever know. And God, we pray that you would be with us in this place, that you would be with us as a church as we seek to follow you, to glorify you, to lift you up above everything else. God, would you be with us? And would you give us your spirit to be the kind of church that is for where you are, that extends grace and seeks to grow in our faith so that the world may see and know the true glory of your name. We pray in your son's name, amen. Well, to change gears just a little bit, uh, I want to talk about salad. And I preached about uh, last night, and, and some people heard with my British accent me saying the word solid. I'm saying salad, vegetables. We've got a picture to prove it. So now my Britishness is out of the way. We fixed that problem. Uh, but I am not a fan of salad. Uh, I know that it's really healthy for you, it's really good for you, and you should eat it, but I am not a salad guy. But what I do like is I like going to salad bars because you get to create the facade that you really like healthy eating without actually having to eat healthy. Because you can go through a salad bar line and pick out whatever you want. So I've gone through many a salad bar appearing to be a healthy eater when really what I'm putting on my plate is excessive quantities of cheese and eggs so that I can have nice cholesterol problems later in life. And where other people fill their bowls with a nice hearty bowl of soup, I put in banana pudding. Now, many people, when they see me do this, and they find out I do this, tell me that I've got what is called a toddler's palate. Uh, I don't know what they're talking about. I see what my toddlers eat, and I like it. I think it looks good. But they seem to be seeing it as an insult. But this idea of being able to go through a line and pick whatever you want and kind of custom make something that you think is healthy is not something that's just limited to a salad bar. Picking and choosing what we want is something I think that pops up in a lot of different areas of our lives. And in fact, I think that our culture is built on the premise that we have the freedom to build whatever lives we choose. And that can be a very, very good thing, but it can also be a very, very bad thing. Because it can extend to things like religious truth and spiritual freedoms. And we think that we can pick and choose a spirituality that's customized to what we prefer and that has ideas that are not found in the truth of the gospel. And despite the fact that we live 2,000 years and 6,000 miles removed from the world of the New Testament that the book of Colossians is written in, the truth is, is that they lived in a culture that wasn't all that different. They lived in a culture that was full of salad bar spirituality where you could pick various ideas and stitch them together to make a religious truth that fit your life and your preferences. And so we open up this amazing book, uh, and one of the challenges that we're going to have over this series is to memorize together as a church, Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Those same verses that popped up on the screen a moment ago when we began. We are going to memorize those, and each week, share them together, speak those together as a reminder of the picture of Jesus that they paint, a God who is over all things. But before we dive too far into this book, I want to give us a little bit of a context as to what we're reading. Because it's very important that when we come to God's Word, we understand what is being written, by whom, and why. 
And so when we open the book of Colossians, we find that this is written by the Apostle Paul, a very famous, important character in the Bible. And he is writing to a church in a place called Colossae. Colossae, we've got a map here, is in what is now modern-day Turkey. And Colossae was, uh, at one time in history, a very, very important city, but by the time of the New Testament, had become a lot less influential. The cities around it, such as Ephesus, that we'll see there just to the left of Colossae, had become a much more important city. And so many people that once went through Colossae for trade and different things now went going there. But this very small city that had become not quite as important to the area surrounding it as it once had been was still important to God. It was still important to the Lord. And so during Paul's missionary journeys throughout this region, he sent out an individual called Epaphras. Epaphras was sent probably out of Ephesus, and he went to Colossae and preached the good news and started a small church there, the Colossian church. And this letter is probably written not too long after the creation of that church. And what we find is that this very young church in this very small city is trying to figure out what it means to follow God, what this message of Jesus really means. And as they try to figure this out in the midst of a culture that is very pick and choose, very different in its different spiritual ideas, they are trying to figure out what that means, how all of these pieces go together. And they get a little confused. And so Epaphras sends to Paul. He goes to visit Paul, who at this time is now in prison in Rome. Uh, Paul has been in prison for preaching the gospel and sharing the news of Jesus. And Epaphras goes to him in prison and asks Paul, can you write to the Colossian church, can you tell them who Jesus really is? Can you tell them about what this message is really all about? And so that's what Paul does. And we get this amazing letter that has one of the highest theological pictures of Jesus in all of the New Testament, a beautiful image of this God who is over all things, who has come to dwell with us in the person of his son. And he writes to them to put their trust and their faith in Christ alone, to see him as the one who loves them and who has saved them. And as we read the opening of Colossians today, we're going to read Paul's prayer for the Colossian church. And what he prays for them, I think, reveals three hopes that Paul has for this church. As he prays, he prays three things. And the first shows that we, he wants this church to have a faith that changes how they think. The second, that he wants this church to have a faith that changes how they live. And thirdly, that they have a faith that changes how they hope. So let's read God's word together. We are in Colossians 1. If you don't have your Bibles, you can read along on the screen. This is what God's word says, starting in verse nine. And so from the day we had, we have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The first thing that we see Paul prays for is that the Colossian church would be filled with the knowledge of God. That he hopes they would be the kind of church whose faith changes how they think. Now, I have always been kind of a hopeless romantic. Even growing up, I kind of imagined myself to be more romantic probably than I was. Uh, And so when I first started dating my wife, Janae, uh, I liked to come up with very elaborate dates to try and impress her because the truth was I was much more interested in her than she was in me. And so I really needed to make this work out because she was very, very pretty. And so I decided I was going to go all out one time on a date early on. I was going to take her to a seafood restaurant by the river. We were going to get dressed up nicely and order fish that we couldn't pronounce so that she would see I was a cultured man. And so I got everything ready, and there was one problem. I spent a lot of time investing in this date and dreaming it up, trying to be romantic, and I never once asked Janae what she might like to do. And you'll find out why that turns out poorly for me. Because we head down to this restaurant, and if you've ever visited Waco, Texas, which is where we lived at the time, you will realize that there is no seafood restaurant by the river that is classy in Waco, Texas. There's a dirty river with a cheap fish joint next to it. 
And so we went down inside, and I could already tell as we arrived that this wasn't quite as impressive as I dreamed it up to be. But we sat down, and I ordered uh, something that I couldn't pronounce, and Janine ordered chicken strips. That was the point where I was like, something is off here. And it turns out that Janine was not a fan of seafood. In fact, Janine hates seafood above all other types of food. And she was now no longer attracted to me. She was repulsed by me because I was eating this gross fish. And the problem, as I said, was that I never spent any time asking Janine what she really wanted. I never spent any time actually getting to know Janine. I thought that I had everything that I needed for a true romantic evening within myself. But the truth is, is true romance comes from getting to know the one that you're pursuing. And relationship with God is the same way. If we want to be in a loving relationship with God, if we want to be close to God, then we need to know who he really is. And that's why Paul prays that the Colossian church would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, so that they would know him. He says, from the day that we have heard of you, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. See, Paul knows that the young Colossian church, more than anything else, needs to know who God is, what the truth of the gospel is. They need to be able to distinguish truth from error in the midst of this salad bar spirituality culture. They need to know who it is that they serve and what he has called them to. One thing that we know from the letter of the Colossians is that there was a lot of different philosophies and ideas circulating around the culture at the time. And one of them was an early form of something called Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, and it wasn't a religion of its own per se. Gnosticism was kind of this salad bar, this stitching together of different ideas from different religious teachings. And what Gnosticism valued above all else was knowledge. Gnostics believed that you needed to be saved by discovering spiritual truth, that you needed to pull from everything in this world to discover true enlightenment. And it's in this respect that I think that the culture of the Colossian church was very similar to our own, because I think that we live in a culture that's very Gnostic. Here's what I mean by that, is that I believe that we live in a time in history and in a culture which values a kind of stitched together spiritual truth. The way that we hear it said is this, what's your truth? What's your truth? Not what's the truth, but what's your truth? What is the enlightenment that you found from your experiences and your picking and choosing from the different things around you? And I think there's a temptation in our culture to think that truth is something that's very subjective, that we build it from our own experiences. But the truth that the Bible talks about, the truth of the gospel, is something that isn't built on us, it's built on God. It's built on who he is. This is why in verses three through five, Paul writes, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since you heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. The gospel is the truth. It is the knowledge of God's will revealed to us. Paul is praying that they would sit down at a table, not as I sat across a table from Janae and think that I had all the knowledge I needed on my side, but that they would sit down at a table across from God and get to know him, know what he values, know what he cares about. And that same challenge is for us today, that as we pursue God and spirituality, that it wouldn't be a salad bar of preferences, but that we would sit down and get to know the God of the Bible, the one who has been there before all things, who knows all things, who is himself truth. This is why we need to memorize scripture and get in God's word, to be a kind of people that read and study and discuss who it is that God is. Don't believe the lie that theology and learning about who God is is something purely for academics and theologians and people who go to seminary because it's for everyone who calls himself a follower of Jesus. There's a reason why many of the students that I work with have a really hard time grasping very basic concepts of the Christian message like grace. It is because they have, in large part, grown up in a culture that hasn't emphasized the importance of being filled with the knowledge of God's will, getting to know what the Bible actually says about things. And in fact, I'm sure many of you have come across people in our culture 
who claim a knowledge of the Bible, but don't really know what the story says. And I think that we as a church shouldn't settle for solid by Christianity that's stitched together from different ideas, but we should pursue the one who wants to be known. God wants to be known and has made himself known to us in the truth of the gospel so that we can enjoy relationship with him. The second thing that Paul prays for in the Colossian church is that he prays that they would walk worthy of the Lord, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And I think we could say it this way, that he wants them to have a faith that changes how they live their lives. Now, we've already talked about my eating habits this morning, so you've probably gathered I'm not a healthy man. I don't take care of myself the way that I should. But uh, this year, I tried to make a difference to that. I tried to get in shape by running my first ever half marathon. Uh, It didn't go well, in case you were wondering. And here's why it didn't go well. I knew that if you were going to run a half marathon, you needed to train really, really well for it. You need to make sure that you were doing a minimum of three runs a week in the months leading up to it. I knew that, but I still kind of sat at home and decided to do something else. I usually got about one in. I also knew that you were supposed to change the way that you eat. You want to be healthy. You want to get in shape, maybe lose a little bit of weight. Uh, I knew that, but I still went to Blue Goose for a box of sick donuts twice a week for myself. I knew these things, but I didn't really get good at it. And all of this culminated in the finish line of the half marathon, where as I came up to the finish line, an 81-year-old man ran past me, and they announced it in front of a crowd of probably a good few thousand people. It's at that point that this 32-year-old suffered his greatest humiliation, knowing that an 81-year-old man had blazed past me in the final moments of this half marathon. Because if we don't live out what we know, that will make a difference in our lives. And equally, if we do live out what we know, it is going to change us. And that's what Paul wants, is he wants the Colossian church to be changed by what they know, to live out what God has taught them about himself. He says in verse 10, following his prayer that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, true knowledge of God's will will always lead to real change in our lives. If our lives do not change, we have not heard the truth. We have not grasped the truth. One of the other Gnostic ideas that was probably circulating around this time was this idea that this life didn't really matter. You see, Gnostics believed that this life was something to be escaped. That, as we've already said, they believed in knowledge. It's about what you know, not what you live. And so their faith wasn't very practical. Their spirituality wasn't very practical. But the Christian faith is very different. Because we're told in the truth of the gospel that God does care about this world, about this life. It matters to God how you live your life. It matters how you live out your relationships and how you relate to other people. It matters how you use your resources, your finances, your giftings. It matters to God how you live in your job. And in your home, it matters to God how you use your body. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul writes, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. That's what he writes to the Corinthian church. And if I read that scripture today, that my body is not my own, that it is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and I believe that truth, and I know that truth, that should impact the way that I live. It's actually one of the reasons I've been convicted this year to think a little bit more about being healthy because God cares about how I treat my body. God also cares about how I use my body, which is why what Dr. Ewan said last week is so important because these things matter to God. I cannot read the scriptures. I cannot read God's truth and then ignore what it says about this life. We must fight the temptation to be the kind of people that fill our minds with the knowledge of God and do not walk in a manner that accords with it. Because for every amount of people that are not filling their minds with the knowledge of God, there is an equal amount of people who are filling their minds with the knowledge of God and not living it. As the biblical writer James puts it, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And I want you to hear this this morning as an encouragement because walking worthy of the Lord is not about perfection. It's not about being the holiest person around. 
It's about trust. It's about trusting that God is with you and for you. See, as you walk out what you have learned in God's truth, you'll find that you will continue to grow, that you will continue to discover more and be filled more with the knowledge of God's will. That's why Paul says, as he prays this, that as we walk worthy of the Lord, we will increase in the knowledge of God. Because there is this cycle of as we discover more about God, we will live it out. And as we live it out, we will find more about who God is. Growth in our lives is going to stall out if we don't live out what God's asking of us. This is the way that I say it to my children. If you don't finish what's on your plate, you don't get to have any more. If we don't live out the things that God has called us to, then growth is going to be stunted. I want to encourage you to be the kind of people, to be together, all of us as a church, the kind of people that live out our faith, that walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, that we would embrace Paul's prayer for the Colossians church and the Holy Spirit's prayer for us because it pleases our Father. It brings pleasure to Him. You know what the most enjoyable part of the half marathon for me was? It wasn't crossing the finish line. It was seeing the look of joy on my wife's face, knowing that she had pleasure in seeing me reach that success. I could care less about the people waiting at the finish line that I didn't know, and I did care about the one that I loved and who loved me and the pleasure that I saw on her face. Friends, when we walk worthy of the Lord, it brings delight to the one who loves us. It brings delight to the one that we seek to love. The last thing that Paul prays for the Colossian church is that they would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. I think the way we can say this is that Paul is praying that they would have a faith that changes how they hope. He writes in verses 11 through 14, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul is finishing up his prayer for the Colossian church by reminding them and praying for them that they would be reminded of not what they need to do, but what God has done for them. The last confusion that we want to talk about this morning of Gnostic spirituality, of these ideas that were circular, circulating around Colossae, is that Gnostics believed the idea of our salvation and spiritual growth rests squarely on our own shoulders. That if we are going to grow as spiritual people, that's on us. That's not what the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches that our hope is not in ourselves, but in Christ. The hope of the Christian faith is not that we save ourselves or grow ourselves or strengthen ourselves. It's that Christ does. And one of the most destructive ideas that hurts the message of the gospel is that human beings are the ones who are supposed to do the work. Perhaps this is a way to think about it. Imagine that you have a, a flat-packed table that you've bought from uh, Home Depot or, or Target or something like that. You bring it home and you know that you are going to have to figure out how to put it together if you want to sit at that table. And it may come with instructions and tools, but at the end of the day, it rests on you to make sure it gets put together so that you can sit at it. The Christian gospel is not the message of a flat pack table that you have to put together. It's the message of a father who has assembled one for you so that you can come and sit down and eat with him. He has put it together so that you can come and sit at a table with him. Paul talks about three things that the Father has done for us in this prayer. The first thing that he talks about is that he has qualified us. The Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. If you feel this morning as though you are unqualified to follow God, I assure you that if you were to trust in Jesus, you are qualified. Not by what you do, but by what the Father has done for you in Jesus. Second, Paul says that he's delivered us from darkness and put us in the kingdom of his beloved son. He's rescued us. We didn't ask him to. We were in darkness. Many of us didn't even know that we needed to be rescued, yet he rescued us anywhere. Loved us anywhere. And lastly, he has redeemed us. He has given us forgiveness of sin. 
He does not hold your past failures against you, and he doesn't hold your future failures against you for that matter either, because he's God and he knows that they are coming. The cross is about forgiveness. It is about grace given to you. I'm sure that there are those of you in this room that are like me, and when you hear a phrase in the Bible like walk worthy of the Lord, it makes you squirm just a little bit because you know it doesn't describe you. Of course it doesn't describe you. That's why Jesus went to the cross, because it didn't describe any of us. But this is the gift that God has given us in Jesus, a new life and the ability to walk worthy, to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Your hope is not in you anymore. If you are in Christ, your hope is in the one who has loved you. All of these things, forgiveness, redemption, hope, are available to you in Christ alone. For the longest time in my youth, I think that my faith was very Gnostic. It was very Gnostic. And what I mean by that is that some of these things we've talked about, the idea that spirituality was something that you had to discover for yourself, that it was something that rested on your shoulders. That was all a part of what I thought Christianity was. I thought that the message of the gospel was about you figuring it out and getting it done. When I read phrases like, walk worthy of the Lord, live a life that's pleasing to the Lord, I thought what the call of God was, was to clean up my life, to build a table, to build something for him, and get it done. And then he would be pleased with me. And because of that, I had no joy in the idea of Christianity. I didn't like it one bit. As my mom took me to church and I sat there and I thought that that's who God was, I had no desire to obey him, no desire to come to him, no desire to love him because I didn't understand who he really was. And I didn't understand what he wanted me to hope in. But by God's grace and his love for me and the love of his church, I came to see that the image of Jesus that I'd built up in my mind was wrong. That the idea of the gospel that I'd built up in my mind was wrong. That God was far better than I had ever imagined him to be. People encouraged me to put my trust into Jesus and to see him as the one who'd done everything necessary for salvation. And when I began to think about these ideas and think about things like grace, I began to see Jesus for who he really was and not who I'd made him out to be. A Jesus that was kind, that was patient, that was forgiving and merciful. I began to have the strength to change my life because I realized that I was not doing this to make God love me. I was doing it because he loved me and because I wanted to delight him, the one who had loved me and rescued me. God wasn't calling me to build something for him. He was calling me to enjoy what he had built for me in his son. Paul's prayer here in chapter one of Colossians is Paul's great hope for the Colossian church, that this church lost in the middle of different spiritual ideas would see the Christ who is over all things and in whom alone is salvation found. And as we continue to read this book and go through the amazing images and pictures and lessons that Paul teaches us, I pray that we, as the Colossian church, would see Jesus for who he really is, the one who loves us, who wants to fill us with the knowledge of God's will, the one who loves us and wants to help us walk worthy of the calling we've received, and the one who strengthens us with all of his might. I urge you to read through this with us together and see that same God who loves you and who has given himself for you. Would you pray with me as we finish this morning? Father, we thank you for your son, whom the book of Colossians elevates above everything else, and we are so excited to continue reading this text and seeing the way that you lift him up. Lord, may Christ be lifted up in our church over these coming weeks, and may we see him as the one who is the source of all truth, the one who has called us to walk worthy of your name and the one who strengthens us to do so. He is the one that we love and in whom we find all our hope. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your son. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.